Well, good afternoon, boys and girls on the uh, in the USA. Good evening over in Europe, and good very early, early, early morning in Asia and Australia. Forgive us, but thank you for getting up so early on the other side. Uh, first of all, how's tomorrow look here on the other side of today? So I'd love to hear how tomorrow looks. Um, with that said, uh, before we jump into the topics, we always want to thank our well-behaved and well-trained sponsors. So today it's Exclusive Networks. Very interesting story as they start to make inroads into the SMB Nation audience. Uh, our longtime friend SureWeb, always doing innovative stuff. Um, we'll get to them as well. But as you know, our format is to have an academic lecture series with real value. And uh, because of sponsors like this, we're on the air, much like public TV and national public radio. So we appreciate their support. Uh, open up your calendars. Jennifer Hallmark uh, is actually in a remote radio control room today. She is in San Diego at Datocon. She'll be there through uh, tonight. So if you're at Datocon, please be sure to look up the infamous Jennifer Hallmark as she does what she does so well at shows. And then I think next up, uh, I can commit to the uh, the CompTIA ChannelCon event in early August in Las Vegas. So a couple things coming up. Uh, the book is out. The 21st book is out if you want to go to smbnation.com. And with that said, before I introduce our guest and we jump right into it, I want to give you the context that a big play in the communities, uh, SMB Nation, IAMCP, has been partner to partner. And so uh, Christian Buckley was active up here in the IAMCP for, uh, Christian, I'll let you tell your own story, but I certainly saw you for a couple of years on the third Thursday lunch at Microsoft Lincoln Square. And if anything, I got a free lunch out of it. So I always enjoyed seeing you. I associate you with food. <laughs> free with food, that. which tastes better, yes. Yes, exactly. So, uh, sir, you control the deck. Let's jump into it and introduce yourself along the way. Thank you very much for joining us. Sure, and do I need to reshare? Are you able to see that? We're good, we're good, okay. just click next. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, you know, appreciate everybody for uh, for joining this and and for having me as well. So yeah, the uh, you know my background with so for those that aren't familiar with IAMCP, it's the International Association of Microsoft Channel Partners. Uh, so I was actually the co-founder of the Seattle chapter and was the president for three and a half years. And I'm still my vice president was Jeff Shuey, who yeah. is the current president and remains that. And I I have official status as the uh, um, what is it the 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 immediate past president um they they have like this this title anyway so i'm still on the masthead somewhere for some well, reason in the academic community you'd be called emeritus but i get the point there you go yeah so i i moved uh from seattle to salt lake city where i'm now based it's funny i most of my uh well all of my clients and most of the work that i do of course is around the world so i'm in my basement office where i'm online doing things just about every day and you know events like this. So uh, just yeah. quick by way of introduction. So I'm a Microsoft MVP and Office uh, Apps and Services MVP. I'm also a Microsoft Regional Director. Um, I've been in the collaboration sector for uh, most of my career, which is almost 30 years now. I was at Microsoft a little over a decade ago. I've been a Chief Evangelist and and Chief Marketing Officer for several ISVs. So I've been in the space for a long time. Uh, and so when you know, this topic is something I'm passionate about because being a SharePoint and a social collaboration guy with the teams filled some very uh, critical user experience needs. Uh, and I've been running my business on it. I think like a lot of us have uh, since day one. Uh, it's not perfect. I, there are a lot of things which I'm in user voice voting up, talking with the product team about. Uh, but I'm a, a definite fanboy of the platform. And so this session that I'm going to be walking through uh, is an overview. It's not supposed to be all encompassing of everything about the administration life of, of teams, but to really focus in on 10 things, which I think are really important to explain why they're there um, and, and why they're important, how they work together and, and how to kind of navigate each of those capabilities. So any any other preamble that you need or are we ready just to kind of jump in? Let's let's do it, man. Right. Do, do Excellent. It, do it so well. <laughs> All right. 
So I, I always like to start off by uh, what we're going to cover and then what we're not going to cover just to set expectations. I mean, the idea here is that I'm going to provide some f foundational things, which I think are just essential for the conversation, that there, there are some keys just to understand of, uh, you know, the, of the architecture at a high level of, of teams, how it interacts with the other workloads. Um, but there's a lot of things I'm not going to get into, um, but it, you'll kind of see as I go through the foundational uh, things in that section. Um, that's going to be about um, 25 minutes of content, uh, and then we're going to have a, a break and then jump into the 10 items. Um, so hopefully, Christian, yeah. If you don't mind, before we double click down, folks, be sure to look at the handout section where there are some very interesting handouts uh, regarding teams and also our, our well-behaved sponsors, and then use the questions feature on the control panel to ask your questions. And we'll probably marshal those questions a little bit along the way, but we will be asking them. Uh, Christian, please continue. Yeah, and, and feel free and as, ask questions that it, we'll try to do it live. We'll try to do some at the end. Uh, and then I'm also always happy to, to follow up with people directly or, or through uh, uh, you know, Harry's team. So uh, the foundational stuff, but here's the list of the 10 that we're gonna go through. So configuring meetings, reviewing and troubleshooting meetings, and we'll talk about the differences between the two, configuring the live events, the new capability, hopefully people are out there experimenting with that, the team's life cycles, so configuring and the management of life cycles of content, uh, or setting the retention policies, setting up the role-based access controls, uh, enabling auditing and creating a new alert, uh, searching through the content, enforcing a naming policy for groups, because groups all come to in the foundational section are an essential part of the understanding of, of how Teams works, and then creating or changing messaging policies. So that's the list of 10. What we're not going to be covering, uh, we're not gonna be going through some of the, just the core capabilities of Teams, how Teams works in the user experience, what is chat, what are tabs, things like that. I'm assuming that people have that basis. Uh, I'm not gonna be going through the requirements and prerequisites for everything nor the licensing of them. I, I'm, I think from an administration standpoint, you know, there, there are nuances with different licensing types, but I'm assuming everyone has an E3 or E5 to be able to do most of what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm not gonna be getting into hybrid or on-prem capabilities and how those things interact with uh, with teams, although I know a lot about the hybrid space. So if there are questions, if organizations have, for example, hybrid exchange, uh, and you have some questions about some of these capabilities, follow up with me afterwards, or I'm maybe ask some questions there. Not gonna talk about Azure AD services and the dependencies there. Um, the, I'm not gonna talk about other workload con dependencies or firewall configurations or network planning. The telephony is not something I'm gonna get into because that is a full day all, all on its own. Uh, and then of course, I'm not gonna talk sports, religion, and multi-level marketing because it's irrelevant to this topic. But ah. again, if you have questions, I can give you my ah. opinion. Yeah, if, if, if you don't mind on that telephony piece, I'm glad we're not covering it because I've been pretty vocal about this. I went whole hog well over a decade ago, scary, about 12 years ago with Microsoft Response Point. Uh, SMB phone system, and, and, and quite frankly, my feelings were hurt when they withdrew it from the market. And so it's a whole nother conversation for a whole nother day, but Microsoft has to earn my trust back with telephony. Just a side comment from the peanut gallery, we're not talking about it, please continue. <laughs> yeah, no, no worries. And, and it's a, so I have a background in telephony, I worked for Pacific Bell for the phone company years ago, so I know something about that. But essentially you have the management tools um, you have the, the graphic interface, user interfaces. There's actually, I've, I've listed here three, but there are actually four admin centers that are, are leveraged for the management of teams. So you have the Office 365 admin center, you have the Teams admin center, the Office 365 security compliance center, and then you have the Azure Active Directory uh, admin center. Um, so there's really four, I just need to modify this slide. Uh, that are, but I'm going to be talking about not talking about the Azure AD, but the other three. I'll give you some examples and screenshots there. You also then do have a lot of room for automation around PowerShell and the Graph API. If you're really looking to get the most granular controls to be able to go in there and build, 
you know, products and services and interact with teams. The graph API is the most robust there. I do have a slide that shows some of the, the nuances, some of the differences there. Um, PowerShell, it's getting more and more robust. It's being added to all the time. Uh, so if you're a, a PowerShell person, I, I make some references here, but I'm talking pre predominantly about the, the GUI uh, interfaces for this. Now, Teams, if you've, you've probably seen a version of this slide, I mean, I really like this slide because of one, and they shared this day one with the presentation when they kind of announced Teams at that presentation in New York City and made the point that uh, Teams was architected on the backs of two uh, you know, very mature platforms, Exchange for all the email-centric things and SharePoint for all of the content. And, and so people were asking questions you know, from day one saying, well, how do I manage all this? How do I go in and audit? How do I do this? Like there was no information, you know, presented in that initial launch around kind of these core administrative tasks. And you had a couple simple statements that were made by, by different Microsoft people um, saying like, well, it, if you've made investments around Exchange, if you've made investments around SharePoint, third party tools, scripting, um, kind of all these other capabilities around it, all of those things are still relevant. They still pertain because if there's a meeting, if it's the email and the shared mailbox, all of the, the chat capability, you want to audit that, you're going to go in and look at and manage those activities. It's done on the exchange workload. I've got an automation that's uh, it's pushing my slides forward here as well. Um, but, but likewise, if there's anything that's uploaded in the system, it's in SharePoint. If it's in OneDrive, it's SharePoint. Um, the shared OneNotes that are developed in, in Teams are all automatically shared to SharePoint. So if you have backup and archiving capabilities in SharePoint, it's relevant and you can manage all of those same assets inside of Teams. All right, so with that, some of the other foundational pieces here. So the conversation storage, just kind of backing up what I just said, the chat service, it's all within Exchange. And so how it leverages that. Again, there are some nuances here if you're in a hybrid environment. Um, but basically everything that happens in the conversations. So if you want to go in there and monitor, you know, sensitive information or certain keywords or monitor individuals, what they're doing, you have the ability to go and back that up uh, as well as you as an, a, in an individual basis, a user, any of the conversations you're in, you have a, a way to export that or back up locally those, those things. But you as an organization, as an administrator, can, uh, can go in and monitor, get alerts on conversations, keywords, sensitive information, file usage. This is just another data point that you can do, which is all exchange-based. File storage, again, it's all of the, the chats. Anything that's, cap that's added in, uploaded into, is automatically, by default, in Teams, shared to SharePoint. So it has all of the, uh, you can have sensitive information that is password protected down to the asset, down to the document you know, level, and manage those things within and within SharePoint. Um, and and people can share those things freely within Teams. You have a concern about sort of that you could you have the ability to see who opened the document, who viewed it, who edited it, who moved it, who downloaded it, all of that around all of the content in Teams because we have that capability inside of SharePoint. And here's, again, another Microsoft slide you've probably seen here, all the various end nodes, as entities that are created, where they're actually stored and then from a compliance standpoint for those uh, that are through, you know, to, to enable that compliance, it's ingested through the exchange workload there. Hopefully that makes sense. The other half of what I, as I mentioned, uh, Office 365 groups, very important. And there's a, I, I've modified a Microsoft slide here slightly to, to help illustrate this, but it, groups is a membership service. Of course, if you recall, um, uh, and I'll just pause this, if you recall when groups was launched, it was not launched as a membership service, although the rewriting of history, Microsoft likes to say, oh yeah, yeah it was always this. No, yeah, go ahead. Christian, yeah, if you don't mind. Uh, I, I want to talk about groups because I, I believe there's a little bit of a, and it's an overused term, don't hang up on me, but I'm going to call it a paradigm shift. And um, 
I literally had to recently give a lecture on Linux directories and file systems, which is quite frankly, that's an illegal lecture in Seattle. And um, I had to train myself for, I, I won't go into the details, but I did. And what was cool, and, and I'll get to the point, was that what I did with my Windows Secrets books in the late 90s, 2000s with Windows NT Server, 2000 Server, and so on, where you put the user into, at the time it was a local group that went into a global group that controlled the resources, UGL, ULGR, UGLR. Um, but Linux has some of that same behavior. But what I want to make a distinction of is I had to revisit that old directory services concept. These groups are different. It's a different paradigm. And I don't, I don't know if you'd take just 10 seconds to draw the distinction between directory services. And these are more like exchange email groups. Is that a fair assessment? Correct. Like a security group. Right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. You know, the way that I, I mean, when I saw groups, the first thing I thought of going back to, you know, early in my career, I thought it is, it's almost like a database. It's a key. It's a unique identifier that ties everything that you do within SharePoint as part of this group and everything that you do in Yammer or Teams or Planner or any other workload that's also part of that group, eventually, and we're not entirely there yet, all of that data tied to that group will be accessible through the Graph API and so that you will be able to go in there and truly do a federated search. I can go and find conversations that are happening in Yammer, in Teams, on yeah, Skype for Business, that. kind of all of yeah. those, because of that unique identifier, that's what that group is. Um, yeah. There's a slide I pulled out of this, but I also explain it, and I worked in the supply chain world as well, and, and I said, you know, the Microsoft had a problem with new product introductions. And so yeah. when they would release yeah, a new product. You're killing me, brother. You're killing me. <laughs> right. I mean, everybody would then go in there and be like, you know, how does this work? What's included? Where does it fit? What's the, oh, all those kinds of things. And we saw that with the Yammer acquisition. We saw that in, you know, in the Office 365 scope. We saw it again with Teams. Like, do I use Teams? Do I use, you know, Yammer for this? Do I use uh, SharePoint for these pieces? Where Where is that? And the idea is that, look, you can use any or all of those things, whatever is most relevant. Microsoft is not going to dictate that but there's a way for it to be tied together. And so the benefit of groups now is that Microsoft can go build some net new product, a new workload, and then say, hey, it's automatically part of your group. And me as a group owner, Office 365 group owner, I know that I have certain admin capability. I can either turn on or off that workload. I have a certain amount of visibility into that. I know that I'm the owner of this and here's my hundred members and they will then, that's the hundred who will have access to that service. So it, it, it helped Microsoft with that, that new product introduction process, but that's kind of my, the way that I explain it. But essentially here, back to the Microsoft slide, it's, you know, it's a user creates a new group for collaboration and it's created through one of those workloads, you know, through Outlook, through Teams, through Yammer, SharePoint, Planner, each of those creates that. It then, once that's created, creates that identity in Azure Active Directory, and then gives it a certain number of resources, the identity, uh, the, the URLs, the owners, the members that are part of that group that you assign. And then, based on where, you're, where you create that, it populates it with the bits and pieces. I mean, I'd like to see this Microsoft very quickly move to where if you create a group, it gives you everything, but maybe doesn't light them up, all of them. If you create it in Teams, SharePoint has to be there, Outlook has to be there, the Exchange piece that has to be there, and Teams, but I may not need Planner and and Yammer and other, other things. But right now, you have different tools that are lit up depending on where you create that group, but all the pieces are there. So you have that one identity, you have the federated resources that are across that, and then you have the loose coupling, which is, again, I look at it as that database key that connects each of those things. And when you think about Microsoft putting so much effort around you know, artificial intelligence and making developing these intelligent applications, that's coming from that loose coupling. That's coming from, it's gonna be get tighter and tighter coupling between them. But that's the, the power of uh, you know, Microsoft 365 not just being a SKU, a name of a SKU for salespeople, but it's really a directionally where Microsoft is going, saying that when I go and do search, it's going to pull from 
windows. It's going to pull from each of the workloads. It's going to pull from my, if I've connected to it, to my network through LinkedIn. It's going to connect to all my local resources on my local drives and pull back a truly federated result. And then I'll be able to automate things built off of that. Um, so again, provisioning that, here's you know, more information around that. Uh, just by default, anybody can create that. Of course, a lot of organizations are locking down that provisioning process. I, I'm okay with locking down the provisioning process, but you should make it. Just realize the more that you lock down a system, the less likely end users will use that system. So if you make it difficult for them to collaborate, they will go around you. And then you have that rogue IT, the shadow IT efforts that are happening. But here's just another view, and I see I'm going to Outlook and Yammer. Yes, I like that. <laughs> Adjust my slides there. Um, but again, you have just again, this is a differences of what's created depending on the workload where you create the Office 365 group. But within Teams, you get that shared inbox, the shared calendar, the doc library, so SharePoint on the back end, the OneNote, the the team site that's created, and then that persistent chat workspace. And, and everything that's linked around that. Um, now, there's more and more that Microsoft is adding to this. As I said, um, I, I, I believe the direction that we're going is that it, no matter where you create it, it'll have all these various assets. But what's, the, what's beautiful about this too is that you don't have to go and do any other setup for this to work. You get a lot of questions uh, automatically where people say, well, I already have a SharePoint site and I'd like to link that to my team. Can I do that? Yes, you can. You can link an existing SharePoint site, an existing Yammer group to that new team. Uh, the various roles, something else that I really like that they did was that they adopted the simplistic Yammer uh, roles or the permissions levels and permissions levels uh, it, within Teams. And again, this simplifies it. It makes it very flat, saying there's the owner, the creator of the team, and then there's the members, and then you can have guests. And uh, it, it, you have soon, I don't know the timeline but for it, but you're going to have the private channels. That'll be something else that you can do. I'll talk about this at the privacy levels. Um, so you can actually have, uh, you know, it adds a little more complexity here, but gives you more options in who you invite in and who has visibility to these things. But that's it. I create it, I'm therefore an owner. I can add other people as owners. Everybody else is, is a member. I give them certain permissions within my team, and then guests have a limited subset of that. So guests are like I'm a guest of a number of my client environments where I have I can go in there and read, I can interact and have the conversation, but I can't create things. I can't add uh, you know integrations, connectors. I can't add tabs. Those are things that the client has to do, and then I interact with them as that guest. Um, other clients, they give me a full login. So I'm, I have a company email um, so that I have full access and can be an admin and a group creator inside of their environment. So you have that option as well. Um, the, the privacy levels, it's again, just like Yammer, it's public or private. Public is that I've created the team and anybody in the organization that has access to inside that organization, anyone within my tenant can see it and go and add themselves to it or or ask to be added to that. Private is that it's only the owner can add people into that team. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you're gonna have this idea of private channels. And why would you do a private channel? Well, here's a great example. If, if you are a project-based organization and set up a team for all project management or even a single project, and you might have then you know, all of your you know, the team member day-to-day -day conversations happening in general, but you might have an event coming up or a release one, release two, release three. However, you set up your channels to manage this project or this client, you might then have a channel for financial discussions where you don't want all of your employees, much less external users to have access. So that's where that, that comes from. Um, so again, how Teams leverages groups. Um, so it's using that, that Azure AD service. Um, you know, the, the you can go in there and it, you basically use the Microsoft Teams user group membership to control um, access to all those different things. Uh, and then to, to add and remove people from that, you can do that through the Teams uh, uh, admin portal. All right, with that, so we're at that point. 
for the sponsor talk. So Harry, back over to you for a few minutes. Yeah, yeah. Well, by my head's spinning, brother. My head is spinning. <laughs> There's a lot of content. Um, well, by the way, I mean I'm learning too. Let's let's get that straight, okay? I I'm learning too today, and thank you for kind of clarifying groups. Uh, I struggled again a little little NTism, and then I'm trying to get out, you know, Outlook, uh, BCC groups, and all that. So thank you, Michael Slater. Are you out there, sir? Uh, actually, no. Actually, Michael's uh, out of Datacon, uh, I guess, uh, not far from uh, from Jenny over there. Uh, oh, James well, Walburn City. Just pull up a chair to uh, Jenny, doggone it. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll send him on a quest to go find her for sure. Yeah, I, I apologize. I, I'm working with a, uh, a slightly uh, outdated call script. So um, let's uh, let's talk. Um, what what is news over at SureWeb? You guys are always doing something. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess uh, just sort of to stay on topic over here, as you mentioned, we're uh, we're a big uh, a big Microsoft house over here. We're really definitely representing uh, Canada and the U.S. Uh, equally over here. Um, so I guess some of the really fun things are is actually uh, is the team's integration actually. So we actually have a telephony solution. I know it's a, a word we're trying to sort of stay away from today. Um, but uh, we do uh, we do have our own uh, in-house developed solution uh, in the telephony side, and we actually have a new connector that integrates with the uh, Microsoft Teams. So definitely. Well, no, but you, you know what? Let's if you don't mind, let's hit that one head on because uh, you know my grievances and resentments from my time in telephony. Um, and and by the way, in all fairness, it's come a long way in the last 15 years. But you and I uh, did an interview. It's posted at smbnation.com. Uh, at the IT Expo show in Fort Lauderdale in basically late January, early February, right before the Super Bowl. So, yeah, you know, cool. sir, yeah. yeah, you know my story. <laughs> and yeah, sure. let's, let's talk about that because you guys have invested in the telephony side and telephony is still relevant. Why don't, why don't we pick it up from there? I mean, what, what are you seeing with the relevancy of telephony as you rebrand it? and extend the capabilities with UC? Because that's really what your offering is, go. Yeah, so so actually, so our telephony is really, it's a carrier grade, it's a really full telephony solution. Um, so obviously for, for SMBs, uh, it's, a, it's a great way to manage costs, um, as well as increase efficiency inside the company. Um, so that's a big play for us. And then obviously, like I said, the Microsoft side of things. Um, so we just sort of, we connected our PBX, so our infrastructure, Okay. Um, our, our carrier grade redundancy and all the fun things that we're able to do here at ShareWeb um, and really just uh, merge it into the interface of Teams. So I was able to do all the file sharing as Christian was kind enough to sort of elaborate on. Um, we are able to offer a more robust telephony solution with some, some obviously some uh, mm -hmm. enterprise grade PBX features as well. It's so like uh, the advanced IVRs and the find me, follow me. Um, yep. along with some of the support features that we offer as well. So it's really, uh, it goes hand in hand. Really, I think a business or telephony is essential to all businesses now, uh, 2019 as it is. And we just really, uh, we, we saw the gap there and saw there's a ton of people doing it. And obviously we, we think we can do it, uh, we can do it pretty well. So uh, along with the Microsoft integration, obviously I'd be a trusted partner. So uh, yeah, it was sort of just, uh, it was just a natural fit for our solution. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. And you know what 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 I'm getting at, Michael. And you know, you 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 and I have also become friends. That's why I feel I have a poetic license to to challenge ourselves in our conversations. But um, you uh, you. So I'll just interrupt you there, Harry. Michael's. Uh, I'm sort of the uh, Mike. I said Michael's off in data oh, there. Oh, so sorry, I'm, sorry. Yeah, well, you know, those, French, those French accents all sound alike. Forgive me. I'm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's it. I do apologize. Yeah, <laughs> no, but I did. I did get a chance to see your your chat with Michael. Definitely, uh, yeah. sorry, just getting uh, getting a little feel for 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 yourself. And obviously, SMB Nation is uh, as as Michael had requested there. Um, but yeah, so no, I so just but feel, still feel free nonetheless there to uh, yeah, <laughs> to poke yeah, the I'll, away I'll, here. I'll still poke the bear, but hey, um, <laughs> let let me change the subject slightly. We have Dennis Wilson, who is a daily blogger in our community and a leading MSP in the Southern California area. And he's, 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 a, I can go on and on about him. He goes to the, all the meetings, the chamber, the, this, the, that he's out there really doing it. So he commented, uh, he says, uh, sure web is a great solution that integrates well with the Microsoft stuff. 
from a company that understands telephony. So a shout out back to SureWeb from Dennis. And when Dennis speaks, people listen. Um, <laughs> What I want to do now, if you don't mind this, I have a couple poll questions and uh, here, well, here they come. So folks, if you could take a second to uh, answer the poll question while you're doing that, I'm just going to remind you of a couple of things. Uh, obviously the question uh, speaks for itself in the answers while we're doing that. If you are indeed at Datocon in San Diego right now uh, in uh, what is their third day, uh, Jennifer Hallmark is there as well as Michael Slater. So let, I finally got that straight on the, the third try. Um, next time you'll see us out in the wild will be CompTIA Channel Con early August. And I'm going to ask the SureWeb group to uh, revisit this entire conversation we just had in French. So we're going to translate it back into French now. <laughs> Jenny, if yeah. you could close up. <laughs> If no problem at all. You say the word, and uh, we'll be right there. All righty. So we have the poll has been completed. Um, Jenny, don't know if you're in a position to go online and read the result. There we go. I can read them for you. So we have not sure is coming in at 19%. Yes, 3%. So that is a green field, my friend. We have headroom. Um, and then... Uh, uh, no is 77%, which would, of course, correlate to the small yeses. Jenny, if you're in a position to put up question number two, let's hit these head on. Appreciate everybody participating in that. And, oh, it looks like, uh, yeah, it looks like we have question number one. Forgive me, folks. See what happens when I'm left uh, to my own devices. Um, so sure, Web, any final comments? Uh, you know, we're, we're going to have some links in the thank you email. You're doing great innovation with the, uh, the ConnectWise integration you just announced. Any yeah. final comments? Um, I guess just, uh, just a little thing, I guess just to touch on the quick help. So for all those who, uh, who aren't familiar with it, it's definitely something I'd, I'd urge you to, uh, to take a look at. Um, it's really, uh, I know internally here at ShareWeb, we're, we're over 800 employees. We have a little bit of a an internal uh, competition, if you will. There's actually a company ranking that you can view through Quick Help as well. Um, so it really just helps you to get your feet wet into all the different services offered by Microsoft. Uh, to go from a novice level to an expert or to an admin level even. And it's like I said, it's just something I can't stress enough. It's the uh, little bit of time um, you may invest and really for the efficiency you'll see out of it. Um, and also something you can offer to your customers as well um, or inter internally at your organizations to really uh, sort of beef up your knowledge there and really really take the, the tools to another level. Well, a couple a couple questions on, on that. Is the quick help a, uh, a hands-on lab or is it sort of procedural learning? Maybe maybe you could tell me what one of the knowledge nuggets looks like in quick help. Do I do I do something or do I read something? Uh, so a little bit of both, right? So how it would work is it's for the most part, it's like little one minute or two minute videos. Um, they'll be often in a series. So they'll be what they call a skill pass. So it might consist of about 10 videos. Um, and it's, uh, it'll get to test your knowledge along the way, but it's primarily uh, little videos showing how to, how to maneuver through the different applications. Um, then like a little knowledge test at the end and night nice certification, like you get to brag about uh, as we do here internally as well. So it's a, uh, so a total package of learning there. Yeah, and I, I, I like that. I call it almost gamification um, that's part of your culture. So I, I received your certificate for cloud. I believe it's cloud architect. It's up on my LinkedIn profile. And, and, and I got to tell you, James, that stuff works. That motivates people. It's a little bit like a ringing a bell with a dog and the dog knows food is coming. It's um, yeah. And, and, and not only was it a gorgeous certificate, I, and, not, I, and guys, I'm serious about this, but it's essentially a form of gamification and people like that. They like to achieve something. They like to put it on their LinkedIn profile. Uh, call it business development by any other name, but I, I, I really like the outcome-based um, curriculum, essentially, that you've developed where you can then um, have an accomplishment and put it on, put it, you know, put, heck, you know, we should get a logo and just put it on your NASCAR mm -hmm. 
leather jacket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like the scouts almost, right? No, it is. But you know what? It's 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 a time tested thing. And then it also sounds like it's a little bit role based in that you you can um, use it for both the MSP and the customer. So I kind of like I, I was hearing role based training fly by as you described the curriculum. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's really like we have uh, right from our front lines all the way to some of our more uh, sort of intricate uh, architects here uh, going through. And it's great to sort of get a knowledge in other aspects, right? So some of us may specialize in, let's say, teams is something I'm, I'm quite familiar with. Um, well, now I can get a little background on dynamics as I move forward to the Microsoft offering. So it's really just to, to build up your, your global knowledge. Um, there's courses that range from 10 minutes all the way to two, three hours for some of the more uh, more in-depth ones like you said those little badges are really great and the internal company rankings are really something we have a good time with as well so yeah, yeah it's a great yeah. way i like it okay well sir uh sorry for mangling your name uh but thank you for uh, articulating your story uh christian i think we're right at time to return back to you my good friend excellent Gary. And we'll, uh, yeah, so we'll just uh, jump right into uh, the, the, the tasks and uh, here we go. The first one, as I mentioned, configuring meetings. So why this matters for organizations, um, it, it, because for most organizations, and certainly with my small team, with the clients that I work with, I mean, how we get work done now is in this interactive collaborative forum. It's like we do that around meetings if you think of the traditional meeting you show up at a conference room and everybody's sitting around the table whether they have laptops or view one of those companies that has a policy that's you know no laptops or laptop lids down and it, people take you know actual notes there however you do that i mean it just the, the culture of your organization drives so much away around the way that you use this this technology and so by going in there and establishing well for the meeting policies um, for example, um, we want to capture record all of our meetings and that's something that with a couple of my clients, it was a kind of a shock to the system there. They weren't aware that I, I had t talking with the IT team or one of the clients that I actually have a login for, I went and turned it on, told the team that I was doing this, but they were surprised where we had the meeting. It was auto capturing that it did the transcription and did a notification and the CEO is like, what is this? What, what is this? It's like, what are you doing? You know, for the, our conversations, like, you know, hang on, it's in mm -hmm. your platform, it's your technology. Then yes, we took notes, but think of as the system gets smarter and smarter, as you start building and automating things to be able to go in the AI to pull out, hey, these were certain tasks, calls to action that were done. There's a great video. I don't have a link to it here. Harry, I know you've seen it. They've used it in a couple of Microsoft uh, uh, you know, keynote presentations. It's kind of like, I think if you go and search for like the Microsoft uh, future of meetings, I think that'll get you to that video. Uh, I believe they did a version of it at the most recent build, but of course they did it at Ignite and, and yeah. uh, partner conference last year where it was of course more advanced capability. So features that we don't have just out of the box here because they have that whatever that device is there that that actually has the 360 camera and everything there. But that's where we're going with the technology um, to be able to, uh, as you're live, you're there, it, it, it's able to recognize the people that are in the room, uh, the kind of get cut through all of the cross chatter that happens in a typical meeting and capture that information. It's a very exciting where things are going. But we have just the more fundamental capabilities, the out-of-the-box Teams experience, to be able to record and then uh, automatically transcript and translate meetings is pretty incredible. And then all of that is instantly searchable. Why this is so important? Uh, so I've been in, as I said, collaboration technology most of my career. Uh, half First half of my career was not inside the Microsoft ecosystem. Uh, and so working with social collaboration, supply chain, things like that. And, and so for, for many years, so back in 2001, where I worked with a company called E2Open as a product manager, building a hosted collaboration platform where we built our own instant messaging protocol and built that into our solution. 
and it automatically saved the transcript from every one of the meetings into yeah. the repository because it's an information asset. It's part of your, you should be able to search on that sensitive terms. If people are discussing in a recorded meeting, if it's your policy to capture all those things of whether people are talking about things which might be relevant to others and searchable, findable within that system. If you can't tell, I'm a bit passionate on that topic. Well, because I'm, I'm a big, big believer in archiving for uh, not only uh, uh, legal purposes, uh, and legal doesn't necessarily mean criminal and overseas bad actors. I'm not talking about that, but it, it, it would be more due diligence and an acquisition and that kind of thing. And then also onboarding, uh, onboarding people who didn't have the email on that, you know, they, they started the next day after the email went out. But I, I mean, again, don't get me going on it, but I, I, I love that feature. <laughs> I always, I use the example of when I started in 94, Five, I think, working for Pacific Bell in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, and the that week, my start week, there's a gentleman who is retiring. And I was taking over a number of projects and systems that he owned. And he handed me this thick, dense three-ring binder where he had been documenting for months, waiting for the, like me to be hired on to start and hand off a bunch of these things. And I would go to him with questions. And he'd be like, ah, oh, it's in the binder. And I would be searching through this binder. I'm like, yeah, I'm not finding it. And he would be like, yeah, there, there it is. And it was just this workflow high level. And I'm like, yeah, I got a billion questions. This doesn't actually tell me anything. And so he would then go through and impart his knowledge of here's what I actually experienced. And actually this group should be, and I would sit in there modifying his diagrams. And I wasted a bunch of time going and updating some of these diagrams in the documentation until I realized that I was the only person who ever referenced the three ring binder. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so then it sat on the shelf where it belonged uh, after that. Um, but I, I even remember thinking, it's like, I just need to record this entire discussion because I'm taking copious notes and I'm gonna miss all the nuggets of information. But you know, that's, that's what we're talking about doing and being able to draw intelligently all this information out of meetings. That's why they're important. Just make that point. I, I tend to soapbox on those kinds of topics. But, <laughs> Please so continue. the configuration, yeah. So so you have the ability, so the settings which are global, said that here's how all meetings must be set up. But then the policies can be assigned by user um, and by the organization um, within a specific team. And so there's a lot that you can do there. Again, you do some things via PowerShell, but in the Teams admin centers where you see that, like in the screenshot here, of going and setting up policies where you could say, hey, for you're a part of, you're one of our business analysts, maybe you give them a little more control over what they can do around teams because it's in their role to capture more of that, the, 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 the company's knowledge, the organizational knowledge. So some of the things you could do to assign there, of course, that around scheduling, what they can schedule and can't do, audio and video capturing, the, uh, you know, all that capability. There's more features that are being added all the time there's more that you can do because of now with the announcements that have come around stream, for example, and the integrations with stream inside of teams and the other workloads. So you'll be able to do more to refine this, to make it very specific that I want this group of users or this team or this organization to be able to do more uh, around uh, you know, how they set up those policies and those settings for teams, uh, for, for meetings going forward. Uh, the second one around reviewing and troubleshooting meetings. And, and so what's the difference here is because, you know, if, if you spend any time trying to do uh, to understand why your organization, why certain business units or, or, or teams, subsets of users are not adopting or are not as actively engaged in the platform as others are, and you're looking at that, part of that might be because they might have a slightly different experience. Maybe they aren't, don't have all the features enabled for that group as another. So if you're looking at why do we see this group, this success and, and high level of adoption and, and, and high level of engagement, they're actively using the platform different from this other business unit. And it may be because the creator of that team or, or whoever, the, the vice president over that or maybe IT turned off half the capabilities. They just can't do as much there. 
or it could be that you're geographically dispersed. And the data, and this is just showing you some of the reporting that's available to go in there and say, well, if they're having a miserable experience because they're located in, let's say that you've got a team that's out of Jordan in the Middle East, and they're, they're operating out of a data center that's a continent away, and it's not performing as well, and that is going to impact their their ability to use this. Or, or it might be that year, as you dig in deeper, um, that it's just not been deployed, that training has not been done, and education, there are needs there. But you won't know this, be prompted on it, unless you're actively going in on a regular basis and looking at how is this being used. And it's not even as important a single data point, a single day in time, but is looking at the trends over time. One thing I would say here um, is that it's the reporting that's out of the box is fairly limited. There are third-party solutions that are out there. If you're looking for tracking longer than these time periods or want more granular control over the time periods that you're looking at, uh, then you, you should look at some of the third-party tool options. Um, but the things to look at, the, the call quality dashboard and the call analytics specifically. So if you are you're, you're looking at the meeting performance, if you have the telephony features that are enabled and you're using those pieces, again, to go in there and look at, you know, at the end of every meeting, every time if you're just using not even the telephony integration, but just using the capabilities through your PCs uh, and people have at the end of each of those meetings, a little five star, the ability, like what was the quality of this meeting? It's important to, I, I look, if I have any, audio or visual issues with that meeting, I don't mark it as five just to get rid of it from the screen. I'm always providing, hey, if it all worked, I mean, I look at that as a key indicator back to my IT team that everything is performing you know, as intended, it worked. Um, otherwise, you need to, and that's just something that you have to train users on. Please don't just ignore, you know, scroll past those options, but actually let us know it all worked, okay because that's an active measurement of whether the system is functioning properly. So that's something that you should be in looking at. All right, uh, configuring the live events. Why this is important is because if you're looking for meetings are great, but those are more of a, uh, of a small, I think of a, a, a team of being like myself and my five direct reports of the 10 to 15 of us that are gathered around a V team around a project. But when you're the CEO looking to do a broadcast out, out to all 2,000 employees of your company, you're not going to launch it through a team. Can you? Yes. Is it the best method for disseminating that information? No. Um, and, and, and so that's why with the stream integration and live meetings through uh, Teams, it's, uh, the, it's, the, you know, it's just a preferred capability. So you do have the ability to go and set up some of that experience. And so again, around scheduling, who can do that, whether it automatically does the transcription, um, other uh, you know, visibility options there and recording options, and, and some of which you can manage through, uh, through PowerShell to be able to enable some of those things. Um, but this you know, treatment for this is you, you may not want to let everybody in the company have the ability to go in there and do these, uh, these live events. And it may make more sense for it to be IT driven or the leadership team or people that are part of a specific role, which you can set up that role based control over this and have uh, certain power users within, you know, across the organization who are authorized to be able to run those. And so here's just some other, uh, again, some of the capability that you could do via um, PowerShell. Um, yeah. And so whether you allow presenters versus just the organizer to do screen sharing um, and, and, you know, the recommendation, again, not limit the bandwidth for sharing, uh, but you have some controls there. Um, so you can actually look at some data as well around how people are actively uh, you know, participating in those uh, events. But there are, again, Microsoft is right, right off the top is saying, hey, there's other third party uh, yeah. uh, solutions out there to see even more robust data um, uh, around this. And what's great about a lot of these third party solutions not that I'm, you know, pushing any specific, uh, uh, you know, company out there around this. Um, I, I uh, one of them is one of my clients, so I'm a bit biased there. But I'll say that, and that's the company Tigraph, by the way. Uh, love Tigraph. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but they that they also each of them has much more robust data beyond just this aspect of it. So if you're looking for even deeper insights in different directions, you know, definitely go and look at some of the third party solutions. Microsoft is not trying to reinvent what all of them are doing. Um, so if you are looking for more robust, then definitely go take a look. Well, and Christian, quickly, uh, well, two things, folks, I put in the co the uh, chat feature, the chat feature, you see link offs to uh, Christian's LinkedIn profile, friend them, as well as Dennis Wilson, follow him, read his blogs. Um, but the uh, on, on, on the third party tools, um, I'll just say it real quick because people get the point, but there's all these opportunities to be a gap filler in the Microsoft ecosystem. Microsoft can't afford to develop solutions essentially that don't become a billion dollar business unit. So there's all these 10 and $15 million gap fillers. That's how SNA Server, uh, they acquired SNA Server in the 90s for mainframe connectivity. That's what it was as an acquisition, right? Go on. I'm yeah, no, sorry. And, and, I'm, and I'm sitting here battling with the auto, uh, uh, you know, fade in there. So, so, so this is the last one. So configuring teams life cycles. This one is actually a, it's a, it's a higher level one. It actually encompasses some of the other capabilities that I'll talk about, but this is something that is core to the ongoing governance of teams of, as a workload, as a platform. Um, so why it matters, of course, um, is that uh, you, you need to ensure that no matter how you're collaborating in your organization, that you're following um, your, your, those governance rules, those requirements that you have for the management of information assets. If you do, we don't really have policies around that, it's because you're not looking more closely. I'm, I'm pretty confident that 99.9% .9 of organizations have some policies around the management of the information, whether it's video, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, text-based or, you know, items, documents, um, those legal requirements are out there. So, um, no matter what, you want to make sure that you have you know, a, a healthy, you could look at best practices, but a healthy life cycle around the way that you use Teams. Because, I mean, one of the fears that I talked about at the beginning, um, that the fact that when you create a new Office 365 group, it generates a new SharePoint team site. When you add channels, it adds essentially a folder inside of adding all those folders inside of SharePoint. So people saw that in the adding of all these other workloads, people were concerned. They saw like SharePoint sprawl all over again inside of Teams, but even <laughs> more so because it's adding, you know, a, a, an Outlook, an, an email inbox. It's adding, you know, all these other assets. Yes, it is. Uh, and, and so you need to be aware of what's being added and the life cycle of each of those things. So you can go in there and configure the Teams creation, part of the provisioning process, for those global settings to say, here's how all teams are created. There's, uh, and then the life cycle of each individual team, how they're managed is done by the owner. Now to help in this process, I mean, Microsoft has talked about, and there's things that, that have been discussed and shared, and we're seeing them roll out over the, the next year. I think we're gonna see a lot more around the templating, the creation of templates inside of teams. So the idea that I can automate and say that we're a project management centric organization. Whenever a team is created, it's one of three templates. It's a project management based, and here's how it's structured. Here's all the channels that are created. Here's the four other SharePoint team sites in tabs uh, that are on every one of those projects. Another one might be uh, virtual teams, or another one might be program based. Um, so it's, it's not a project which is time based, but a program which is ongoing it's like an initiative that is, there's a V team that's associated with that. So you you can go in there and set, it's establish, if, if somebody comes and requests to IT, I need to create a new team, you'd be like, all right, you get one of three flavors, which one would you like? And it automatically though, then goes in and constructs with certain infrastructural components that are automatically there in place. And yeah, co yeah. comment on that, Harry. Yeah, well, uh, actually, it's from a uh, longtime SMB Nation member, Randy uh, Spengler. He is asking, can you, what is that third party tool? And I understand you you disclose that you do business with them in, in the spirit of being a Wall Street analyst. Thank you. Um, but I'm going to spell that out in chat. What is the name of that tool, 
because now they're yes, the company's name is Tygraph. So T Y Graph, Tygraph.com, and they're especially if you're uh, they're they're broadly used across uh, Microsoft. Well known. Um, John White is a is an MVP, um, and uh, again well well known. And actually, you've got and then Dean Swan is also an MVP. So two MVPs there. Um, they're they're Toronto based, uh, but they've got customers around the world. Probably see John and Dean at events. They're speaking all around the world as well. Um, but they have the rom most robust analytics for SharePoint and Yammer, and then they've added a ton around Teams as well. So they're and they are enterprise solution that looks at all of the key workloads. So some really cool stuff. And they've been you know in that space working on Office 365 longer than just about anybody. So. Got it. It's in chat. Okay, continue. Anyway, so yeah, back into it. So again, so where you manage these pieces, so it's in the Teams Admin Center, going in there and looking at the Teams activity. And so it's, again, it's a little more granular, you know, out of the box, the capability there, but being aware of if you, uh, and this kind of speaks to what I'll talk about a little bit later, but the naming conventions for your teams is also very important for, for you to determine if you do have three types of teams, whether, you know, the, since the templating capability is not all there yet and you may not be automated, but you can go in there and kind of manually govern how teams are created now and identify the three, if you have those three, for example, uh, in the naming convention so that you can easily see, ah, these five are program-based, they're ongoing, these two are uh, like external, like event-based, uh, and then the rest of them are all project-based and be able to see that visually until those templates are there. Um, so Microsoft recommends this, initiate active and sunsetting of capabilities. Most of it, again, you can set up and determine things that are at that high level, but most of these things are more of that ongoing governance of the team owner. And the next cycle, again, I, I hate referring to them as teams teams. Uh, <laughs> it's confusing. I jokingly refer to them as team squads sometimes um, but I, I refer to them as when you create a team uh, that it creates then the workspace and so the team's workspaces and that's the name of the team all the channels within that uh, and so you have the configuration which is for everybody that's part of the provisioning process that you do company-wide or platform-wide and then you have the ongoing management certain things that you need to think about when you're creating when you're actively managing those things, and then when you're closing them down at the end, and there's other things that Microsoft is doing that are really important. Like they've uh, uh, they've they're pushing out now this new AI capability where it's automatically going in there. You've probably seen this in your uh, in your tenant already, where it's removing uh, the from the visibility in the navigation teams that you're not accessing frequently. So you're only seeing the most active, the, the teams. They're still there, you've not lost them, um, but it just makes it easier if it recognizes you've not accessed it in the last uh, you know, two weeks, therefore it drops out of view there and you just go down into the hidden ones and find it and make it, you know, you could, it's, you'll still get mentions, app mentions, you'll still be able to search on that content. But then of course you have the PowerShell and the Graph API capabilities where you can do even more automation around these things. And here's again where, as I mentioned earlier, you can see some of the differences of the more granular capabilities of the Graph API, but it is also a developer-centric experience. PowerShell IT pros can go in there, pull up certain data, and, and wow, I didn't need to never turn that, that uh, automatic transition on again. I've been there, brother. I've been there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So uh, I didn't realize that I had done that on this, but uh, but you have much more granular control of those things is the point there. And then the fifth one before our next break here is setting the retention policies. And of course, why this is important, again, it goes back, it's part of that life cycle management is that if you don't know what your retention policies are for intellectual property in your organization, I swear you have a rule, you have requirements, go find yeah. out what those are. Uh, and if you don't know what they are, just as a, a, a rule of thumb, you know, legally it's like seven to 10 years. Uh, so just be aware of what that, that is. And that does pertain to conversations as well as documents. So that's just something to be do, to watch for. So the retention policies, um, so you can set this independently around conversations, around channel messages. 
uh, and then file use retention policies inside of SharePoint and Microsoft has guidance around that specifically, as well as in expiration policy, those automatic you know, defaults that you can again configure that globally. And you can even manage some of these activities um, you know, at the Azure AD level, role-based, um, but you, you have the default settings that you go there and, and, and do these. And then uh, you know, and once they're gone, if, if, uh, if content has been deleted, been removed, it's gone, gone. Um, that's why a lot of organizations, I think some of the first questions when teams rolled out was, can I have more granular control over backup and recovery? And how do I do that? Well, there's what's out of the box. And if you have more robust requirements, that's when you go third party. Uh, a, a comment, and then we'll uh, jump over and talk with Elliot in a second. Elliot, you're, you're, almost, you're almost here, but on retention policies, you know, I've owned and operated SMB Nation for 20 years, I've been involved in a number of startups, and, and Christian, it always starts out as polka dot and puppy dog tails, and everybody's getting along until they're not. <laughs> right. And especially if you're in an investor-backed startup, you for damn sure better have a retention policy. I'll just leave it there. <laughs> but you know, I, I'm, I, the only reason I'm sensitive to this topic is before I started my tech career, uh, before I got married, for two years I was a runner for a law firm. And so I managed the physical documents and taking them to file storage and would have to go pull, do, do document runs to our storage unit. And so I got lectured on the fact that when that attorney says, it is now time to destroy these, like I needed to ensure that I had them in my car, taking them to the facility and getting the acknowledgement that they were officially destroyed. You know, so yeah. it, it kind of burned that into my, that, my mind. And so this is something, again, when you think of the sprawl that's out there and, and having spent so much time in the SharePoint world uh, where organizations would leave these former team sites in place and they had no idea what content was still floating around out there, that causes problems when you go do a legal hold, you know? Yeah, let me let me pause you. Folks, listen to your computer speaker for the video. Jenny in the radio control room is teeing it up. We got a little intro video for exclusive and then we're going to talk with them. Chinny? All righty, we're back. So we're going to have a talk with Elliot Long. Elliot, are you out there? 
Can you hear me? Because I do believe I am here. Okay, so we're going to put the polling question up. Uh, I want to have a little fun with you, Elliot. I, I, you're a fun company, and I'll talk about that more later with that Thirsty Club. But did you know 31 years ago, Eddie Murphy was Prince Akeem in the movie um, Coming to America 31 years ago? And you're a European-based country that is uh, starting a, a dial. I, I realize you've been in America, and you are in America, but... Let's just pretend for a second you're starting a dialogue with the uh, SMB Nation audience uh, coming from Europe. So, sir, I want to welcome you to America. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Of course, I, I'm, I'm not coming in here with any royalty like Eddie Murphy did when he came over. <laughs> yeah, but you come with probably the, 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 the best conference party I've ever been to at the Fortinet, uh, the recent Fortinet conference down in Orlando. It's your branded Thirsty Club. I think it speaks for itself. But uh, we have the poll up, folks. If you can answer that, we are going to go the full time today because Christian Buckley still has a little bit more to cover. But Sir Elliot, what is your story, my friend? Well... Uh, first, maybe maybe about me, and you know why I uh, came over to Exclusive. I've been in the industry for, and I've been helping businesses um, save themselves from themselves and from outside influences for 37 years. I started in data center and did data networking and telecom and wireless, and then I've been doing uh, cybersecurity architecture for quite a few years. Now I'm a technology evangelist for Exclusive. And it's good job to get if you can get it. I recommend it. I get to talk about technology. I get to stay abreast of what is the breaking trends and the best technology and where we're getting our best bang for the bucks in the entire industry. And I advise our customers, our partners, and uh, internally on how we can go forward. Yeah. So I, I, I'm doing that. I, I really like it. Um, and another thing I do is I try to break down esoteric technology so it's conceptually digestible to people. So I do some education as well. Yes, you I, do. <laughs> I'm a good I'm a good fit at e, uh, exclusive. And it and you're right. It is pretty cool to work for a French company. And I've gotten to meet a lot of my um, brethren system and sales engineers in Europe from places like, you know, Finland and Bulgaria and France and Spain. And uh, we have a really large group of people in England. And um, as you know, we're kind of new in North America. We've right. only been here for a few years, but you know, that's part of our expansion and part of, and, and result of our ex success. Probably a part of that reason, uh, Go ahead, Harry. You got a question? Yeah, yeah, Elliot, forgive me. Um, uh, we have the second poll question up. Uh, folks, please participate. Again, we, we have a well-trained, well-behaved sponsor that allows us to be on the air in the way we like to be on the air. And part of that is, is if you could participate in the poll and also give them a fair shake. Uh, Elliot, please continue, sir, with your, your, your story. I do have a few questions for you, but we'll get to those. Okay. All right. All right. Um, well, Part of the reason for our success with, you know, doubling every two years is that we're focused. Yep. And unlike a lot of distributors that do this, and, and many people at Exclusive have prior distribution experience at other companies, yep. a lot of the other distributors are broad line. So if you were in need of a toner cartridge and a supercomputer, you could get it from the same place. Yep. And all the exercise bicycles and, and Dutch ovens and everything <laughs> in between. We concentrate on cybersecurity and cloud exclusively, no pun intended, but it's already complex enough. We focus on that and that's all that we do. So we're able to, to benefit from that um, cybersecurity exclusive, exclusivity and, and get that out there. So, um, you yeah, know, I love you, specialists, Europe, by the way, Europe, I love specialists. Okay, yeah, a lot of specialists. Europe has, because they've been doing this longer than us, a pretty well-established, what we call in the business, a line card. These are the vendors and the services that they are already demonstrated proficiency at. Starting in North America kind of fresh, we kind of, we could have adopted a lot of those same relationships and just started over with, you know, European exclusive in America. But this is a dynamic industry, cybersecurity. And so, 
it's constantly evolving and the same people don't always stay on top and there's newcomers that have great solutions. So we started over and we are developing a brand new line card with, you know, constantly looking over our shoulder to our European brethren. and we do work well together. Yeah. Um, but we're selecting just the best cybersecurity solutions that we can find. And we're constantly reviewing every new technology and vendor and looking for the best ways to do things. And we're going slowly because you can't always understand everything right away. So we're being careful. And we currently have 10 vendors in North America that we're representing. Okay. And Fortinet is our anchor vendor. And they're yeah. a really good anchor vendor because they have a strategy for um, making the rest of the solutions complementary through their Fabric Connect program, which just uh, you know depends on where how far you develop that Fabric uh, Connect program allows divergent solutions to work together to help end users, and you can integrate that as much as you can. It's just a matter of. Uh, of how much effort you put into them and Fortinet sponsors that program and advocates it. And that's right. They even support, you know, integrating with some of the technologies that might actually be considered a competitor, but in the name of serving end users and customers and solutions, they advocate that. So we're really, um, happy about being a Fortinet partner and we call them our anchor partner. They have a broad, uh, spectrum of, of many different solutions. And Fabric Connect is not the only reason. There's also, you know, ROI and uh, cost benefit analysis that yeah. that make them such a good good vendor. Well, Elliot, I've, I've got some questions stacked up here, so let me let me look over here. I'm on. Uh, forgive me. I'm looking at screen number two. Uh, we have uh, Linda asking uh, from a cybersecurity perspective, uh, what what is the definition of a, an SMB from your point of view? Okay, well, from my point of view, because um, I would be humble and, and quickly realize that SMB Nation can more clearly <laughs> identify what those distinctions between uh, what an SMB is. You guys have a very well-developed de definition. What I'm offering is a uh, cybersecurity-specific definition. What differentiates SMB from small-medium enterprise, from a large enterprise, um, from a cybersecurity perspective? And I would say that it has to be staffing. And a lot of SMBs will only have a part-time cybersecurity person tending to their needs. And, you know, I can't just always say it's part-time, but they'll have one person that does the networking and the cybersecurity, another person that does the database and the computers, you know, and so they, they have this modicum of effort, staffing effort, taking care of their cybersecurity. Where a small medium enterprise, again, it's on the small side, they might have one entire person dedicated to cybersecurity, or he may be wearing multiple hats. As And both of these uh, uh, are different from the large enterprise, which have staffs, full-on staffs, global reach, uh, security operations centers, seams, and some heavy-duty technology protecting their companies. And SMBs and large enterprises are vulnerable to the same attacks. Yep, yep. Yeah, I, I've heard enterprises described as just a bunch of little SMBs put together. Um, friend of mine who did some work at T-Mobile uh, based out of Seattle. But hey, uh, uh, an interesting question. This might be a little bit of a left turn, but I'll, I'll take it. Uh, uh, Jack out right. of Denver is asking, what are hacker strawberries? What are hacker strawberries? <laughs> good, good, good. It's a it's a term I used before. Now, you, you guys don't know me that well, but I'm, I'm happy to solve that. I do a lot of horticulture on the side and there's certain plants that are uh, easy to grow and not really even worth it. There's other plants that are easy to grow and definitely worth it, you know, so depends on where that spectrum you are. And we consider strawberries to be one of the easiest to grow things, minimal effort and lots and lots and lots of nutritional impact. We kind of consider small medium businesses from the hacker perspective to be hacker strawberries hmm. easy to attack and uh, a lot of payoff not in big cash piles but it was a, it was low hanging fruit it was easy to get to hacker strawberries that's the term we use hey I, we, we only have time for one more i've got like four more to go but i'm gonna i'm gonna give it my best shot um from your perspective uh, the question is, what are some of the services that a trusted partner can offer an, an SMB? Hmm. 
I have a grid that is full of them from, you know, we're a distributor, so we can take care of all that procurement, shipping, staging. We can put practically any piece of equipment and it doesn't need to be on our line card. It can be almost anything, almost anywhere in the world in any type of preparedness you would like it. In terms of a pre-configuration, unwrapped, taxes paid for, delivered, hand, concierge, all kinds of capabilities like this as well as all the typical day one, day two, day, uh, I call it day N. Day N is your patching and your uh, breach remediation stuff that normally a reseller would offer. We can also offer those through our resellers. It boils down to we can do pretty much anything in cybersecurity infrastructure, allowing small, medium businesses to kind of like take their business and run unencumbered. Yeah. Well, Elliot, this is just our first date, so there'll be plenty more dates ahead. And uh, <laughs> right on. <laughs> so thank you, thank you, sir. And uh, I know people are they're 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 chomping at the bit, folks. We're probably going to run a little bit over today if Christian's schedule allows. Uh, we we have uh, some content. Christian, rock and roll, buddy. Thank you, Elliot. You're uh, welcome. Let me reshare here. Yes, sir. Probably don't want to see that view. Uh, where's the? Oh, I yeah, I know what you did. Yeah, you got to reverse the the presenter. Yeah, there you go. In there. <laughs> All right. Yeah, All right, well, switch screens on me here, but we'll uh, we'll go strong for the end here. So hang on, let me. All righty, we're back. All right. Um, let me get that out of the way. Yeah, so let me jump over. Of course, and move that right in the way. Let's see, Christian, we're still there. We go. There uh, we go. Number yes. six. Yep, number right. six. So the role-based access control. So uh, again, why this matters is that if you're a small company, so speaking of small businesses, um, where you own every task within Teams. The reality is the larger you get that it starts to be distributed between you know the, the various functions even across departments but there's something that more important here is that you know you don't want to have it owning every aspect of that that's a number one complaint from end users on their uh, adoption and engagement is that you know everything is dictated and they don't have the freedom to go and collaborate the way that they need which may be different it could be very nuanced between you know, uh, uh, teams, owners, and uh, and organizations. And so the more that you can push down or just distribute that management of those activities, it increases the response time for end users dealing with the person that they know, their lead on that. It puts the, uh, it's a crazy idea, but put the decisions in the hands of the people that are actually running the projects and know how it should be run. But at the same time, this is where you've got the global controls over how sites are provisioned and how meetings are captured and recorded and transcripted and made searchable instantly. You can do that at that organization or tenant level, um, but you improve that uh, that overall end user satisfaction when it's at that team's level. So here's some ex examples. And Microsoft provides a lot of guidance around these and out of the box what you can do as well as you know guidance on how to go and set these up. And they created these four kind of core roles and I've gotten the slides here that you have access to, and wow, that is jumping past everything. I don't know why, um, but you've got differences between them. It's it's on it's like it's it's alive here. Um, but to go and set that up, it's really uh, it's again through the Security Compliance Center. So you create that role and group. Here's this Team Service Administrator. Um, I want to go in and wow, it's just moving by. It's 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 got it's it's alive, Harry. Um, exactly. Go create that. Um, Selecting the role, so each of the different functions that you want, um, the, the things that you, the capabilities that you want to build out there, select each one of those for that role. Um, then go and add the personnel. Um, you know, my, my small company, I've got part-time employees and I've got my family members, so I've got my daughter here. I always tell, I tell her when I demo stuff that I always fire her, and uh, she was a little bit hurt, but you know, fake hurt by that, but uh, it was okay. Um, in the end, she wasn't fired. I, I didn't let her go as my daughter. But then create that role or that group, and it makes that easier. When I talked about um, you know the example of having that 
business analyst function, or maybe you have specific uh, specialists that can run the live meetings, create that role, give them those capabilities. And so when somebody changes roles, you go in and look at their profile, you see, oh, they're part of these three specific um, role-based you know, uh, groups and be able to go and manage that um, based on those tax, uh, tasks and those activities. Uh, so it's just, it's Microsoft recommends to do that rather than um, like, again, from the SharePoint world perspective, we had all these end level permissions that were out there because somebody needed to get something done. You went and gave them admin access so they could do what they needed to do. And then you forgot to remove that access. And so here with the role base, you can make it very granular, very specific and, and better manage what's happening around those activities. But the next one, um, so the auditing and creating the new alert policy. Um, why this matters, of course, is because you want, as any organization does, want to be able to go in there and search across a user around a project or a site, a channel, a keyword, kind of all these different things. You want to be able to go in and audit those capabilities and then be able to proactively um, track that behavior, especially around projects or sensitive content. I mean, I remember a few years back, not inside Microsoft ecosystem, this was uh, years before any of this was really a thing. Um, so around the year 2000, the year 2000, sorry, I love ah. that. Stuff, you know. All right, anyway, uh, if you if you know that reference, uh, yeah, we, we all chuckled and the rest of you are just uh, raised an eyebrow. Um, but the uh, back then was that uh, it was a project. It, we were we were sharing something. We had external vendors that were part of this kind of shared drive, and somebody just added into the shared drive, thinking it was secure to a folder within the shared drive, all of the financial information, including salary information. Yeah, it was a bad day for that person <laughs> who did that, um, and then caused a lot of consternation where peers saw what the other peers were making. It was bad. Um, so being able to go in there and, and set up and monitor if you see um, sensitive information in parts of the organization where they shouldn't be, or that you want to uh, have alerts on certain activities, um, be able to go in there to the auditing capability, which of course part of the security and compliance, you've got the audit log search there um, to create, uh, you know, the alerts again are by default um, it'll, it's not turned on. So you have to turn that on and it will automatically uh, record the, the, the last 90 days. Um, and then the 30 minutes around the event occurrence. And so it, it's great. You can go and look at what's happening there, get email notifications of new events, things that you can, you know, uh, uh, get, you know, monitor immediately, um, to go in there and create a new alert policy. Also then within that audit log search at the bottom, you'll see the button. You can go in there, look for specific activities, create a combination of activities uh, to set up. Again, I just created this new alert policy, sensitive information, what I want, the, how I want to be alerted, the, the activities that are included. And here I'm picking on Audrey again, the, the one or multiple users. Uh, and so this happens, I mean, I help do this for a, a client who was, it wasn't picking on certain users, but it was a very sensitive uh, project they wanted to be aware of of leakage of information and who had access and they saw that and it was a valid uh, uh, reason but that one user in particular was downloading locally a lot of this content sensitive information um, and they just needed training on uh, okay it actually here's how you use the tools properly you don't need to be doing it this manual way uh, and so corrected that problem but they, they were alerted to those activities through this uh, alert policy uh, searching content is kind of the second half to that. Um, yeah. You don't know, you're auditing, you're setting up some of those those alerts here, but sometimes you just want to go in there and look at, again, based on you know keywords, date ranges, location, whatever that is, so you can proactively monitor. If you know that you need to put a legal hold or create a specific a case for e-discovery because there's some other broader actions being taken, um, or just retain that content. And you, you can't do those things uh, well uh, if, you're, if you don't go and if you don't, aren't aware where all of those assets are and have an idea, a semblance of other um, you know, keywords, other, other content and actions that are taken in context to that critical information. 
So I, to, to go and simply monitor an individual and their activities, um, and you may want to then broaden that around specific projects or, or keywords where there's high levels of activity around that user, for example. So in the, in the family of content around those things. That's why that's important to be able to do that. And again, within the security and compliance, just right below the audit, you have the ability to do that content search. You can search within the chat and channel messages. Um, you've got that within the compliance center. There's some nuances for uh, how to find and, and locate the chats if you are in a hybrid scenario. So you have that hybrid exchange model with the hybrid connector into Office 365. Um, there's Microsoft is changing that. I don't know the time frame for that. So they're making it more of a unified experience for compliance purposes, um, but it's slightly different for if you have that uh, environment. Um, and then of course the, the metadata for calls and meetings, uh, and then the actions that you can take there and export those depending on the needs around those content searches. So you have popular searches that you're doing on a regular basis. You can go right into those saved searches and pull those up, adding all the conditions, the locations that you're drawing from. Uh, and again, there are third party solutions that do a little more robust in the storing of information around this, but captured today, you've got all of that robust meeting information. Now the live, uh, events that you can capture, all the telephony data around that, um, call transfers, just kind of uh, some very rich data around all of that activity. Here's a popular one. It came up. There's a new uh, capabilities around this, but I mentioned earlier about the naming policies around groups specifically. And this was a concern with, um, uh, you know, we're creating these teams, but we have existing Yammer and SharePoint team sites and groups. And, and making sure that things are consistent in the way that you're creating groups and then creating teams and all those kinds of things. If you don't have just even a, there's Microsoft has the best practices. I've got a link that's here in the content, um, but around your naming conventions, it's something that you should think about very quickly. And even just adding a, a, a you know, a, a pre and post, you know, some a mention of like the organization have a, an acronym or have some method of being able to easily identify like the template styles. It's a project, it's a program, uh, it, it's a, you know, it, it's a V team, whatever those things are. It allows you to very quickly, whether you're searching for content or auditing your system to be able to see, you know, what type of team that is, what it's tied to and the other various assets that are there. If you're creating something that was generated, it was created in Office 365 group via Yammer, it might have a slightly different naming convention so that you know that it was pre predominantly a Yammer centric collaboration that should be in your naming convention or SharePoint centric or team centric or planner centric. That's where that began and was added onto because that is going to contribute to how artifacts data information is captured within that group uh, and it might then dictate how you go and audit that and search for content within that because it might be very Yammer centric or, T or SharePoint centric or planner centric tasks and such. Question. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Are there any restricted characters uh, that only a few of us on this webinar would recall 8.3 naming conventions? Do you have restricted characters in naming in this? Yeah, there all there always are. I don't know them offhand. I mean, Microsoft has that. It, there there is that guidance as well. I believe that's on their best practices for their naming convention. Has either a link to that or has that listed on that site, which is you know all the stuff that I'm referencing. Of course, you can find out on docs.microsoft.com. But I've got links to where you get kind of the overview to each of these pieces. Thank you. So there's and here's the the, the link there again. It may be right there in the group's naming policy. I mean, I've seen it. I know it's there. But it, it, it's groups has that just as you can find the naming conventions. It should be fairly consistent between each of the workloads. Uh, so the specialized characters, things like that. They're always kind of expanding that. Like, can I use a uh, you know uh, uh, you know brackets? Can I use you know, star? Can I you know asterisk? I mean, all those kinds of things that are restricted. And so that's why you see uh, you know underscore or hyphen that are used fairly you know commonly but why in your naming convention to be very specific with the structure of that. It's almost like, uh, you know, back in the old day, the data, data center way and the, uh, you've, you've got the way of communicating um, before XML really kicked in where, 
you know, the first three characters are the department, you know, the next three characters are, you know, this is getting into kind of the, uh, you know, the manufacturing data sharing, you know, the, the old, old way of, uh, of sending that, uh, you know, the raw files, but it's very in specific, intentional in the naming convention of what each of those meant and where that data was coming from. Um, so again, some guidance around this, something that you should definitely go in there and think about uh, and that, that can apply to, um, you know, how you structure and organize and govern um, all of your groups and then each of the workloads within that. And then finally, um, the creating or changing the messaging policies. And just like as I started with uh, meetings and ending with messages, and why this is so important is because um, the conversation, chat, in context to the work that's being done is critical to the way that modern collaboration is done. I mean, I, I've been, I'm on record in, being in the SharePoint space for the last 15 years, uh, you know, talking about the, the importance of the social aspect of our conversations, the chat-based, um, the you know, smileys, sharing, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the gifts. I mean, all that kind of activity is, can be critical to the adoption and engagement of end users. If the culture of your organization is very social, then enabling that same social capability can be a key to get it, keeping people engaged within the platform. Um, it's, well, it, Christian, what, yeah. what, what I would offer is it's also, there, there's a bigger conversation that this is the evolution of language, right? That right. If, yeah. if you heard the founding fathers today, well, 200 and some odd years ago, right? If, if you heard them talking, you probably wouldn't understand half the things they're saying. Okay, right. languages yeah. evolve. <laughs> Go on. Yeah, yeah. Four score and twenty years of, years ago yeah. today. Hashtag history. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. I I can see them, you know, speaking that way definitely. Um, but um, yeah, so the how you go and establish, uh, you know, by, by default, and I, I say by default, leave all of this on. Let the, the organization determine um, what can and can't be done. I see so too many organizations that go in and say, you know, I don't, I, this is all just a waste of time. We don't need to be able to add stickers to that. Um, we don't need to do all this other capability. And then, you know, people see it as this sterile, unfriendly environment. And then they go and have those, those conversations through other unmonitored, uh, officially unsupported platforms, yeah. and then you lose out, and then they start talking about and sharing sensitive information to those other platforms. I'm not saying that you leave it out open for everything that should be done, knowing what the capability is, and have guidance for organizations of how they should use those things. Um, but there's you have the ability to go in there if you're if you're encouraging. Um, users to recognize um, the good work of their peers. You want to be able to leave some of this capability in because this is how they're expressing that. Here's how, and then you can capture information around that. How often are people, if people are abusing um, animated GIFs, you can measure those things. You can see yeah. who is doing what and where and whether it's getting, it's becoming inappropriate and then be able to do, take action based on that. But by default, you want to support what the organization does. Like here is the plain Jane, out of the box, my uninteresting small organization of my part-time employees. I have everything turned on and I have one setting. Everyone can use all of those things because I want to encourage, you know, as as I, my employees use it, um, you know, that I see kind of what team, what project, what client that we're working on together and you have different styles that are relevant and it's just a friendly environment because I leave that open. So some of the other policies, again, considerations, are there specific features that you do need to restrict? I mean, ask that question there. Um, but by default, you know, everybody has that, it's company-wide, or it's, it's, but you have the ability to go in there and set different um, policies at a lower level as well. And so it's all done through that Teams, formerly called the Teams and Skype, environment uh, just to wrap up here oh wait question. i've got audio that i need to turn off there apologies well that's annoying now two voices here yeah, but you no know problem. you've got the links to it all here um and then two great books that you can see at the bottom there the office 365 for it pros that it was 
authored by uh, two my, uh, MVPs. I thought I deleted all the audio. Apologies for that. And then there's the team on LinkedIn learning as well as another great resource. All just, right. Well, one last thing. Uh, just to wrap oh, Okay, go ahead. Yep, yep. Well, it's, the one last one is a link to the, the, the Microsoft Teams virtual summit that just happened. There's an all access pass. I actually have an expanded version of my session that is in an ebook that's available through that site as well. So yeah, apologies for the audio there, but um, again, if you have any questions on any of this or uh, any commentary, feel free to reach out to me. Of course, I know, you know, uh, you know, thank you. Uh, thanks again, Harry and team for inviting me to participate. I'll definitely, I'll be out your way in a month and a half. Um, oh, right on, but, let's get together. Amen. Yeah, but I'll be, I'm coming out there for the uh, uh, the SharePoint Fest Seattle event. Yeah. So I'm doing, yeah. uh, I think, three sessions there. Yeah, I and, go to that. Uh, yep, yep, I go to yeah. that. I'll be there. And then, of course, next month I'll be down in Las Vegas. I'll be down there at the Microsoft Inspire, uh, just floating around. I don't think said, I said this at the beginning, what what I do, what my company does, but I was uh, – like some of our your sponsors here, I'm, I've been for a, over the last decade a, a chief marketing officer. I now provide fractional CMO services to ISVs and SIs, predominantly within the uh, the Microsoft ecosystem. So most of the ISVs in the SharePoint space I know well or have worked with, but I write, uh, I author, you know, white papers and eBooks and other articles uh, for a lot of them, and then provide other various uh, consulting services for. Uh, ISVs and tech companies, but uh, again, well versed in the partner space. If you have any questions about that as well, you can find my site at collabtalk.com or find me very, very through all the various uh, social channels as Buckley Planet. Yeah, well, sir, you, my good lord. Hey, one question. It, this is a silly one, uh, and then a couple of comments I'll respond to quickly, folks. So, Dennis Wilson saying, "What's behind the Cal Poly shirt?" So. My son's uh, one in aerospace at Cal Poly, works in an undisclosed location in the Mojave Desert at a missile site. And then the other just finished his second year at Cal Poly. So engineering rocks. Um, the great have, school for engineering. I, yeah, always yeah. Always quality interactions with Cal Poly grads. Excellent, excellent. And then uh, link to the recorded session. Yes, Randy, we're gonna get you the link. Uh, we're gonna get you a copy of the deck. Uh, Jenny, if you could work with Christian on extracting those links from the deck too as part of the thank you notice. So we have link extraction. People are, I, I got one guy, Bill, trying to click the screen that is a video <laughs> feed. Bill, I, I get it. The links do not work. We're going to get you the we link. We to upgrade windows for that. Yes. <laughs> and <laughs> same, same with Paul Fisher. He's trying to get the uh, the links to work. Guys, we got you covered. Jenny will take extra care of you tomorrow with a thank you note. Uh, we are out of time. So once again, thank you to our well-behaved uh, sponsors, uh, SureWeb and Exclusive Networks that allow us to be on the air and bring true academic content. Christian, I'm going to buy you a, a cup of coffee or something stronger next time you're out. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, it's great to talk to you again, and we'll see you in Seattle in a month and a half. All righty, and Jenny in the radio control room live from Datto, by the way, double dipping. Jenny, thank you very much. Go ahead and take us out. Folks, have a great day. See you, Harry. Yep.